I'd like to welcome our viewers to our program on a series of conversations that we're going to be having with the authors of articles that were published in the Journal of Educational Controversy. Uh, the journal is published at the Woodring College of Education here at Western Washington University uh, in the state of Washington. My name is Lorraine Casperson, and uh, I am the editor of the journal, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome all of our uh, viewers today. One of the goals uh, of the journal is to engage in a more authentic conversation about education and to encourage a deeper discussion uh, with the general public and its legislators, along with parents and teachers and policymakers and other, uh, uh, other professionals, about the fundamental questions dealing with public schools, the role of public schools in a democratic society, especially a society that is becoming increasingly uh, diverse, increasingly pluralistic. We want to be able to examine some of the tensions, the contradictions, um, the, the controversies, the dilemmas that arise in uh, a democratic society and the role of the, of the public in it. Viewers can read the actual articles by, by the authors by going to our webpage of the Journal of Educational Controversy. The issue of the journal that we are going to be discussing focuses on a very important issue in this state and across the nation. It has been referred to as the school to prison pipeline. And it refers to a national trend in which students are increasingly being pushed out of the public schools and into the juvenile justice system. Uh, it is also a pro problem that has disproportionately affected students of color, uh, students with disabilities, uh, poor students, and also students from other disenfranchised communities. And so it raises for us some very serious questions about this nation's commitment to its youth, to their education, and to social justice and equal treatment. Today, our guest is former Justice Bobby Bridge, who wrote an article for our issue on the school to prison pipeline that's entitled, No Single Source, No Single Solution, Why We Should Broaden Our Perspective of the School to Prison Pipeline and Look to the Court in Redirecting Youth from It. Uh, it was also uh, co-authored by Lila Curtis and Nicholas uh, Oakley. Uh, Justice, Justice Bridge uh, served on the Washington Supreme Court from 1999 to 2007. Prior to her tenure on the Supreme Court, uh, she served for 10 years as a King County Superior Court judge, where she was also chief juvenile court judge for three years. Uh, since leaving the court, Justice Bridge has formed a youth advocacy group uh, called the Center for Children and Youth uh, Justice, and we hope to also talk a little bit today about her, her new center. With me today are my co-interviewers. Professor Daniel Lawner is the professor of theater at the Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Western Washington University. Uh, where he served as dean for uh, several years in the 1980s. Dan has also been a longtime member of the ACLU Board of Directors of Washington State, and he is the co-editor for this issue of the School to Prison Pipeline. And Dan will bring a set of legal concerns and questions uh, to the topic. Our second interviewer is Professor John Richardson, who is Professor Emeritus at Western Washington University. And his area of expertise is the field of sociology of education. And so John brings a sociological set of concerns to the topic of the school to prison pipeline. John is also the associate editor for the Journal of Educational Controversy. And so I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to our program today. 
Uh, Justice Bridge, I thought we might start by helping our viewers uh, to understand a little bit about what it is we're going to be talking about. Um, what is the school to prison pipeline? What does it mean? It is a phenomenon uh, and an unfortunately increasing phenomenon of uh, young people being pushed out of public schools. And uh, once they are pushed out from public schools for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into um, as we um, go on with this discussion, I would assume, but um, we know that they become uh, increasingly at risk for not only poor economic outcomes, which have been obviously very well stated in a lot of a lot of journals, a lot of newspaper, um, for example, you know what it costs someone who is who doesn't get a high school diploma, for example, over the course of his or her lifetime and the like, what it costs a community um, by way of of um, re reduced um, earnings and reduced taxing. Um, ability to pay taxes and the like contributions to the community. But what we're talking about here is um, the way in which, uh, by being pushed out of school, uh, the, these young people become increasingly at risk for criminal behavior and getting themselves engaged in the um, juvenile justice system and ultimately into the adult um, justice system. And um, there have been many, many uh, pieces of research over the course of the past decade for sure, but probably over the last 20 years, which um, um, indicate to us that in fact those, those, those results are what occurs when someone is, is pushed out of school, ultimately does not receive a diploma. I noticed that in your paper, um, even though you mentioned that there are many factors contributing to the school to prison pipeline, the one that you have chosen to focus on is the uh, issue of truancy uh, and uh, excessive absenteeism from school. Um, why did you focus on that topic uh, in your paper, and how does truancy contribute to the school to prison pipeline? Well, Fundamentally, because I believe that the discussion um, to date has really been focused on not necessarily the wrong end. It's, a, it's an important part of the um, um, num numerous conflicting issues that, that components, that make up the components of the school to prison pipeline. But it really is that part of the pipeline where there, where it is where, where many warning signs have already been ignored. And a child is a lot further into that pipeline when we start focusing on the issues of concern that we usually talk about in the school to prison pipeline than we could be if we, if we started to concentrate on truancy. And here's what, what I mean by that. In our focus on uh, school to prison pipeline in the recent past, in the past two or three years, um, we really focused on issues of school discipline uh, zero tolerance policies uh, which lead to school discipline and ultimately suspension and expulsion uh, from school. We've also focused on the increased again because of, of um, co the Columbine phenomenon for example, uh, concerns for school safety, the increasing use of um, law enforcement personnel in, in school buildings. Uh, creating, um, one would argue, and actually can be demonstrated in research, a, an increased opportunity for what would ordinarily be um, minor disputes that, or conflicts that might arise in a school setting, not to be resolved by the vice principal or the principal or school personnel in general, but an immediate response to call the police and, and, and gauge it as, or, or um, define it, therefore, as a um, as, a, as an issue for public safety as opposed to something that could be resolved in the, in the normal setting of school. Uh, criminalizing conduct that wasn't criminalized before. That has been a focus and it is absolutely uh, important and imperative that we do that, particularly because it leads to um, increasing what we already know in our criminal justice and juvenile justice systems are huge disproportionalities um, from the standpoint of kids of color, kids who have been involved in the foster care system and the like. However, um, that's a, an intervention orientation that while I certainly a applaud um, raising our level of concern about, when we take a look at, uh, a look a little deeper, what we know is that warning signs, the same kinds of warning signs about disengagement in school, and that's really what we're talking about, pushing kids out of school, subjecting them to out of school suspensions, for example, uh, begins a, um, a phenomenon of disengagement 
from the educational process in the young person, um, even before they begin to, or uh, if they do, fall um, prey to the uh, in engagement in the juvenile justice system. So for a while, there is an opportunity to call that back, to try to re-engage the young person in school. And by doing that, and you can do that before expulsions and suspensions have operated, you can do it by looking at a couple of warning signs. The warning signs being um, absent, beginning to be a failure in school um, in some core, in, in some core um, courses, but, but most appropriately for this discussion, absenteeism. Kids are voting with their feet, as it were. They're not understanding. They have multi the issues in their family. There are community issues that combine um, and um, cause them not to want to go to school. All of these various factors that um, are, are coming into play really result in absenteeism. And that's our earliest and best, um, I would argue, warning sign. And that's when we re really need to, take, to pay attention, not after the kid is further along into this, what we know now is a pipeline. I know that in your paper, um, you talk a about how the court can become uh, a leader in this field and um, about different kinds of reforms that, um, that you recommend. I thought, before we talk a little bit about the reforms, um, yesterday I asked some parents, what do you know about the, the uh, truancy policy in your school? And most parents know nothing about it. Uh, they, one said to me, uh, well, it was probably in some packet that I received in the beginning of the uh, year, but uh, I don't know very much about it. Perhaps it might be helpful for our viewers if you could just talk a little bit about the Washington State truancy laws and statutes, and uh, you know what are they? Uh, what what do they? What are the procedures? And well, Washington State has one of the more prescriptive um, statutes relating to um, failure to attend school. Uh, it's an old statute, but it's the prescriptive part, and what we live under, the processes that we live under now um, are from the 1995 statute, which bore the name of a young woman called Rebecca Hedman, the so-called Becca Law. And the Becca Laws incorporate not just truancy, but also at-risk youth, uh, some proceedings for at-risk youth in general, um, kids who are running away from home, kids who are having... Um, serious difficulties in their homes. There's an opportunity for parents to bring various petitions uh, to the court in order to seek some court involvement in, in resolving the issues in the family when, when all else has failed. And there are certain screenings um, that all else must have been showed to have been failed, they have failed. But in truancy, um, another um, area, because of we knew um, at-risk youth um, show, demonstrate the fact that they are on track to um, become more seriously involved in a negative, um, on, on negative outcomes for themselves uh, if they stop coming to school. Uh, we know, for example, that research has shown that um, if kids stop coming to school, they're at much higher rates at risk, not only of criminal engagement in criminal conduct, but also of substance abuse, of um, uh, undetected suffering from undetected mental health issues, somatic complaints, which also go undetected, all because they're essentially disengaging themselves from you know, their major community as young people, which is the school system. So that um, and a lot of other factors um, inspired the legislature uh, to pass the Becca Law and to say that we were going to pay attention to kids who were not coming to school. And the, um, the uh, stage was set, the threshold was set at looking at um, children who have, even from their very first absence, there is a requirement on the part of the school to contact the parent and find out, inquire, what, uh, what was the reason for the absence. Within two absences, the school is required to engage the parents in a conference, uh, again, as to how the school can be helpful to um, bring the child back uh, to school. Uh, uh, then, uh, if there are five absences within a month or more than ten within a school year, the school is obligated, if, that is not, if the other situations have not, or the other in, um, engagements have not um, resolved the absenteeism, the school is required to file a petition. 
That petition is a petition in court, and the petition seeks the court's assistance in, first of all, declaring that this child is subject to the Becca law, that they are, by definition, truant because the um, requisite number of absences have occurred, and look to an order from the court to return to school, and an order to the school to say, here's what um, kinds of solutions need to be looked at in order to re-engage this child in, into school. The problem with that, of course, is that it immediately gets the court involved in a, an adversarial position, the school district versus the parent and the child. The child is, is always named as a party. The parent need not be. The practice for most districts in, this, in the state of Washington do, in fact, also name the parent, but also the practice is that in most courts around the state, the parent is rarely engaged as a party, um, at least in the, um, the formal court process, which is unfortunate. And um, courts um, began to see that this was not the way to, that we were going to get kids most effectively reengaged in school. Uh, the statute has been amended a couple of times in order to provide more leeway to courts um, to withhold the legal term is stay, but to withhold any further court um, in involvement um, pending uh, the opportunity for the school and the, and the parents and the community to uh, com whatever community resources may be brought to bear to come to try to resolve, come together to try to resolve the issues um, themselves without getting into this formal process. Um, the statute also, um, some years ago, added specifically a way to divert, um, again, it's a legal terminology, meaning to divert the child from the formal court process. This diversion would be a community truancy board that is specifically called out um, as a, one of the um, ways in which the court can um, give the school and the child and the family an opportunity to resolve the issues, again, without getting into the formal process. It's always been the intent of the statute um, that the court was to be the place of last resort. Um, now we know by research and um, outcome data that that is as it should be because mm -hmm. the court process itself is the least effective and um, arguably the, um, the most likely to result in more negative outcomes for the child uh, than um, any of the other options mm -hmm. that we try to explore. What I'm trying to, um, to do in this, in this paper and what we were, have been doing through the um, Models for Change initiative in the state of Washington is to demonstrate that there are, in fact, other ways in which the court can assist in providing accountability of all the parties to ensure that the absenteeism is resolved and the child once again goes back to school, but can do it in a way which is a, in a problem-solving mode, mm -hmm. in a leadership and collaborative mode, as opposed to the more traditional process of the court um, holding a hearing in an adversarial um, uh, environment. I do have one question, though, about the formal process before we go into sure. the reforms that you're recommending. You argue that the, uh, the courts uh, can become a uh, place to resolve these issues and um, can take a leadership role. There was a case that came down by the uh, Washington State Supreme Court. I think it was just last year. Um, it was after, of course, you left the court. It was uh, Bellevue School District versus uh, ES. Mm -hmm. And um, the ACLU and other groups were very concerned about the fact that young children, really, are uh, who go before the uh, truancy court uh, during the initial fact-finding uh, uh, hearing, um, they have no representation, they have no right to legal representation. And yet, at that initial hearing, uh, they are uh, asked to agree to uh, things which have consequences for them. Um, and they may not understand the proceedings. They may be intimidated by the, by the proceedings. Um, and yet they're told that they have a right to present their evidence, to, uh, uh, to give, uh, you know, bring witnesses, to question the school representative, uh, and question their evidence, and yet all of this without legal representation. Uh, once, of course, that they enter into an agreement, then they can be held 
uh, in contempt of court and faced even juvenile detention as a sanction. Um, and yet, even though the uh, Court of Appeals ruled in favor of the student, uh, the Supreme Court overturned it. And I have a quote here. Um, they said, um, the issues that are before the court on the initial hearing, um, at an initial hearing on a truancy petition are uncomplicated and straightforward. I don't think they're that uncomplicated and straightforward for the child who is there alone trying to defend himself or her, herself. I was wondering, what is your take about that decision that came down last year? Well, I certainly wouldn't want to argue with my former colleagues, but um, it was based upon, I think, um, a long line of cases. First of all, uh, that long line of cases relating to when the right to counsel attaches. In, the, in this particular process, unlike a lot of other states, I might add, the, um, the process for truancy here in the state of Washington is a civil matter. It's not a criminal matter. And um, so that would be the first rationale for saying there's no absolute right to counsel in a civil proceeding, and there isn't. And so there's a long line of cases, and once you get into that analogy, that's the, um, the road you can go down. Um, the court did talk about the question of what was being decided in that preliminary hearing. It does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but for the most part, that preliminary hearing is to only resolve one issue, and that is whether or not the child's absences have met the statutory threshold. This is why the court referred to it as a relatively simple, a simple um, determination, factual determination. And um, in most jurisdictions in this state as well, the um, school district is not represented by a lawyer either. It is the school district representative who is the truancy liaison, at least that's the practice in King County. In other, area, in other um, portions of the state, it's, it's an actual school administrative uh, official as opposed to someone who is actually doing truancy solely, um, uh, specializing in truancy. And the order that results is no more complicated, and I am you know, use the terms advisedly, than to say you must go back to school. And if you don't go back to school, then you will, um, you are subject to contempt. And at the time of the contempt proceeding is when the child is entitled to a lawyer. Uh, because at that point, there are options for the court to, as you um, indicated, uh, perhaps be sanctioned to detention, although that is used fairly uh, infrequently in the state of Washington. I would argue not enough, but um, certainly infrequently. And there are other, other things that might be ordered, um, um, including um, engagement in services uh, um, at the time of the contempt proceeding. But it is at that point when, as the court saw it, at that point it begins to look, since there is a penalty involved, which, which, is, um, which can, be as much up, can be incarceration, that that is when the right to counsel, even though this is a civil proceeding, would kick in. Do you agree with it? I don't think that detention should be used for truant students. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we have so many other alternatives now which are available. I think that um, what we're trying, what we're really trying mm -hmm. to do is to avoid a court hearing at all, which is what a lot of these various um, uh, counties, court jurisdictions in the state of Washington have been experimenting with over the past, well, let's see, probably once they began their initial research and determined where their baseline demographics were and processes were, to now probably they've been involved for about three years and we have good evaluations coming out of the work that they've done in order to avoid having the, the children even at a, an initial hearing. So I think that's really where the emphasis needs to be placed. Do I agree or disagree that they should be entitled to counsel at the beginning? Um, I don't know. I think that if we do, if we do keep it to as I described it, which most jurisdictions do, where you are, it really is almost a rudimentary decision as to is this the attendance record, and here's the school district representative, um, 
that um, probably the right to counsel does not need to attach. Would it be better if they had lawyers? And they do in, certain, in some counties in this state? Probably, but, but the reason why it would be better, in my opinion, is that it's more likely to resolve itself at that stage by having the lawyer act as a, as a mediator instead of the judge being placed in a mediator's role um, at the time of a formal hearing. So that they, you know, in the proverbial hallway outside the courtroom, the school and the parents and the child are coming together to, um, to alleviate um, the absenteeism. By definition, remember, um, the petition filing itself and the having of a hearing as a result of that petition filing is only happening because the school has been unable either to locate the parent or to find out what's, what's really happening with the parent and the child that has resulted in an absenteeism. I'd like to turn to my co-interviewers now and uh, have them engage in our conversation. Dan, uh, do you want to uh, raise any issues? Yeah, I was interested in the part of your article, Justice Bridge, which talks about um, the stages that the court can use to help alleviate the situation. One is, and you can help me understand exactly where in the process these are keyed in, uh, because I'm not sure I remember too accurately, but uh, the first stage has to do with uh, an information session that the student and the and uh, parents are sent to to get to get information about how to avoid truancy. Mm -hmm. And the second one, uh, if that fails, um, is um, uh, um, a session with a truancy specialist, which I take it is one-to-one -one with the student. And the third session is a mentor. Mm -hmm. The third step mm -hmm. is a mentor. And I was intrigued by, by this process because one of the things that seemed to me to be, to be prevalent in so many of the steps that are more common in the uh, STPP scholarship. So many of the phenomena that are involved in, in um, and, and the, the, the causes of students falling into the school to prison pipeline. Part of the problem seems to be that there's very little opportunity to really hear the child. Mm -hmm. And those opportunities where the child can be heard um, are tough for the child to take advantage of because the child is intimidated or doesn't know how to frame his or her own problem or, you know. Um, or is only asked yes or no questions. Yeah, well, and doesn't know what will happen when he or she returns to school and the kids ask questions about what went on. Um, and so whatever the complications of the child's situation are hard to get from the child. I guess my question from all of this is what, what, I, what in the process enables the court to, in the process as you understand it and are trying to advocate, um, allows us to hear from the child, allows, allows the child to um, articulate in some way what the problem is and help the caregivers uh, craft a solution for them and, and lend support which is meaningful and helpful. You're so right. The, um, the critical voice is the child's voice, without a doubt. Um, the second most critical voice is the family's voice. Yeah. Um, again, uh, the paper goes in at <coughs> some length, um, although at some length, about the um, extent to which the, 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 the family's role uh, in either having a child um, <coughs> believe that school is an important place for him or her to be um, or not, it really begins at home and the kind of support that, that, that um, he or she receives there. So those two voices are, are paramount, um, in my opinion. I think what you're describing is the Clark County process, uh, the, um, <coughs> the uh, truancy court project in Clark County, which really does allow for a lot of opportunity outside of the court for individuals to talk to one another and to try to resolve um, the issues, to try to find what's really going on with this child. We know, for example, from research that was done in Clark County, that um, when they started using an assessment tool for, for kids um, who were 
uh, who were identified as being truant by virtue of having a petition filed, so hence the court had jurisdiction. Um, uh, assess an assessment was administered to them, which was a basically baseline mental health assessment, and found that these children were um, experiencing more, more um, symptomatology of significant mental health issues yeah. than the kids who were coming in to, this, to the same court by virtue of a juvenile delinquency petition. And so we know that, that, that there the are Maisie, troubles. The Maisie instrument. The Maisie, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a real eye-opener, not just to Clark County, but to folks all around the state with whom it has now been shared, to say, you know, these are not, um, to the extent you thought so at any point in time, these are, these are not ca cavalier absences that are happening when children reach the level of absences that allow a court, or I'm sorry, allow a school, require a school indeed, to, um, to file a petition. There are significant issues, uh, some of which are mental health and orientation, others of which, um, you know, maybe um, have, have, other, um, have other reasons for, um, for the, um, the uh, behavior. So um, where the court comes in, in Clark County, for example, is um, first of all as a convener in developing these kinds of <coughs> systems where, or alternative to the regular system, to convene the major players and say, look, we've got to do better. Here are what these kids look like in our community. They are troubled. They need resources. Um, parents often do not have either the understanding or the resources to be a powerful advocate for their own children. Uh, the schools lack resources. We need to come together and bring service providers in the community together and figure out what would be a good triaging, if you will, um, to um, be able to, first of all, discern what really is behind the absenteeism, what supports the family needs in order to ensure that the child may come back to school. There, there are just almost as many reasons as there are children, but they, but they cluster around issues having to do with, first of all, parents not being aware of the obligation, parents themselves who had limited education and really don't understand why education is important, even if what, even if all you are concerned about, and, and again, I use that term advisedly, even if what you're concerned about is the economic circumstances of the family, schooling is so important in order to improve those economic circumstances. You know, that, that argument, that, that, um, that information needs to be made aware to the parent. The parent may not be English speaking. The parent, um, may have um, concerns for, well, have uh, a need for the child to stay home to take care of a, of a younger sibling in order for the parents themselves to work to, to allow the, parent, the uh, family to survive. Multitudes of reasons. Um, the child may be afraid. Uh, there may be gang uh, in, in infestation in the community and he, is, he or she is, is scared to even walk to school or scared to be at school because he's being bullied for all kinds of information. That's very complicated. That doesn't come out in a court hearing. That's does, that it doesn't lead itself to sort of the, the um, typical adversarial system. So what, what the Clark County Court is doing in partnership with its educational service district as co-leaders, if you will, were brought people together, um, including parents and children who had been through this process, so young people by that time instead of um, children, youth, um, to talk about their experiences and what might make a difference. How could we have found out earlier what these issues were and provided the, the proper kind of support rather than bringing you to court in the first instance? And so they came up with, um, first of all, what you were describing as a workshop, which now happens in many of the counties. It happens in virtually all of the counties that are working under Models for Change, but also is being adopted and adapted in um, various other counties where Folks come together who um, are at risk. This, this can be pre-petition or it can be post-petition, but parents and children who are at risk of either um, being on the eligibility list for a filing of a petition or who are already there can just learn about this process, what the law says, as Lorraine had asked, what the law says about their obligation to go to school, what the, and then what some of these consequences are, what some of these negative consequences are for children who do not go to school. And that includes the economic, but it also includes the social um, and other kinds of impacts um, and, and risks that they are uh, subject to based upon the fact that they are not engaged in school and, and in a school program. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood, depending upon the county, uh, uh, 60 and between 60 and 70 percent of the kids and their parents who come to these kinds of workshops return to school and 
and um, are successfully um, re-engaged in their schoolwork. One of the other features I should add to this uh, workshop that you didn't mention is not just a learning about um, the process and learning about the negative consequences of, of not resolving this excessive absenteeism, but they also have an opportunity to sit down and talk to one another. And um, a school representative and the, and the child, in some instances, we're using peer mediators. So actually, the child is talking to um, someone who is, is, is a near peer, uh, someone who is a little bit older, sometimes a teenager, but most likely a college a student who can uh, talk to this young person to try to get to hear the voice of the young person as to why they are missing school. Some of that, um, it, you know, it's up to the child whether that gets um, brought back to the table um, in the mediate in the mediated um, um, process. But um, for the most part, kids are very open. You know, once once they are provided an opportunity to discuss it with somebody with whom they feel comfortable and they have a trust, trusting relationship with, it it works amazingly. So, and um, the child and the and the family and then the school representative come together, um, either with an adult mediator or with a continuation of having the uh, the peer mediator, and they resolve themselves there to work on an agreement where everybody has a role. The student agrees to do to go back to school. The school, um, now having heard that um, there is a, for example, significant conflict between this child and another student who he's in class with, let's remove him from that situation, see if we can't shore up some supports there. This is an example. Um, the school agrees to do that. The, um, the parent agrees that um, they will do whatever they can to ensure that the child goes to school. We're talking for the most part now about middle school and, and high school age kids for the most part who are the subject of truancy petitions. Some would argue that it should be younger, but let's not get off on that right now. So that the, where the parent is basically saying, I will do my best. Um, I will help whatever, you know, if he needs an alarm clock, if whatever he needs, this is what I will contribute to this situation. So everyone is held accountable. It isn't all focused on the child. Um, the, um, certainly the, the positive outcomes we're searched for is a focus on the child, but um, everybody is responsible. And um, off they go. And then if that doesn't work, um, if the absent, absenteeism persists, perhaps we haven't gotten to what's really going on. Um, or perhaps the services, um, if there in fact were services discussed, perhaps they were not availed of. There were transportation issues or there, were, um, there was a long waiting list. I mean, uh, the, the list can, can go on. But then get to the next level. We're a co community truancy board. Two, three people, usually three, I'm, three or four people who come together again to have a, a, a bolstering of the situation to let these families and the child know that the community is there to help. What can we do to ensure, you know, these things were supposed to happen, why didn't they? What else can we do here? And then finally, when that doesn't work, again, um, a, one -on, a more one-on-one -on -one specialist who not only can hopefully ensure that by this time almost almost 100 percent of the time you would have some services which are needed. Um, why isn't it? Why is it that these services are not being engaged? How can we help? Is it a member a matter of driving you to an appointment? Is it a matter that we need to advocate for you to get to the top of the line in this particular um, community-based organization? What can we do to make sure that um, that that the child gets back in school? And, but it's it, 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 levels of intensity uh, frequently. In the meantime, the court is there to receive reports, to um, uh, perhaps um, you know, act a, as its own kind of mediator if that seems to be necessary, um, because the court can then be engaged in a, in a problem-solving activity, which is more and more frequent now with our drug courts and other kinds of, of uh, reforms that we've done in order to make the court more effective than just in an adversarial process. So the court is there um, to hold people accountable if necessary, but the formal court process has not been engaged. Nobody's going to a hearing. Nobody is, need, is in need of a lawyer, and yet the hopefully the work is being done. And these are varying kinds of um, experiments that have been going on in changing of the process around this state. And uh, Clark County's is a prime example of a great success as a result of, of doing things differently. Well, uh, who is, is on the uh, community truancy board, and what authority do they have? It's all voluntary, of course, uh, as most diversion programs are, yeah. uh, by the way. But um, 
uh, that varies as well. Um, in, um, in Clark County, um, typically their community truancy boards consist of someone from the school. It doesn't necessarily, it could be a classroom teacher. It might be the classroom teacher for one of the children, but maybe not. Uh, because typically these boards will hear, you know, two, maybe three cases in a session. So, uh, and the sessions may be every week, twice a month, again, depending upon the jurisdiction. But typically there will be somebody with an education background. So, uh, typically there will be someone with a mental health background. If there appears to be an indication of uh, substance abuse or some other kinds of issue of that, whatever that might be, um, a learning disability, whatever, um, a person in that capacity as well. And then a person who is a parent, an interested party who loves kids and wants to help kids, um, retirees, uh, retired professionals, um, um, all of the above um, are utilized in these community truancy boards. And they, uh, they, are, they have been developed um, to mimic um, community boards, which have been used for a very long time in this state on the juvenile delinquency side for minor offenses, um, uh, youth in this state, um, who now we're talking about offenses, but uh, for minor offenses, um, at least two, on at least two occasions, a child will have an opportunity to go to a, 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 a board, a community accountability board is what they're usually called, CABs. Uh, and those uh, boards are made up of just the same kind of folks um, that uh, we discussed for the community truancy board. and. Um, and are hugely successful. 90, 95% of the, of the kids who go before those community accountability boards or whatever they may be called in the local jurisdiction never again um, uh, commit an offense, uh, return to um, successful and, pr and productive lives. So we weren't sort of making this up. We were, we were trying to take a model which we knew worked in a, a different kind of setting, arguably an even more difficult setting because there we were talking about a child who had engaged in criminal conduct and yet, and with truancy, we're not, we're not at that stage yet. Um, and so uh, we thought if it works for this level of, um, of, uh, of behavior, maybe it can work in, um, in the truancy setting, and it certainly has been worked. Mm. And so what, if the, the, the truancy board talks with the child and the parents, and any, are other people called in? Like like uh, other agencies that have helped uh, that are supposed to, that were supposed to be involved in the coordination of of uh, what shall we say care that was devised in the first stage of the process. Um, typically not, but um, but some boards do. Um, you know, again, at the um, the uh, the parents and child have to agree to this kind of a process, but. Um, they can act as overseers. Um, they can say, you know, we'd like to hear from you in a week and see whether or not Agency X has, has um, done the, the initial screening, uh -huh. that they've accepted you, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the conversation is really limited to the parent and, the, and to the child. Okay. Um, because otherwise it's beginning to smack of a more formal proceeding and you might as well have a judge there. Um, uh, uh, but, and, and it depends, in Spokane, uh, which it makes great use of community truancy boards, they have not yet adopted their workshop um, as, a, as, a, as a first sort of screen, um, but um, they are making great use of community truancy boards in virtually all of their districts now in, in Spokane County. I think there's a few remaining who still don't have um, boards per se, but, um, they um, not infrequently, their boards uh, not infrequently um, seek to have some oversight um, so that they are monitoring the progress and again not have to involve the court because they are uh, taking that responsibility on themselves to monitor the progress. Time is of the essence here. I mean there was a reason for five absences and and ten absences as being a threshold every day um, that a child is absent from school, particularly at the middle school and high school level that, that this is focused on. Um, really results in, in more and more um, likelihood that they're going to be failing in a core course, that they will be um, developing attitudinal um, issues, I guess, um, so that, that school becomes more and more of a remote place. Um, it's kind of like the self-fulfilling hypothesis that, you know, I don't want to go there because I'll be embarrassed to go back because I've missed so much school, and yet it just keeps, um, keeps escalating. And then at, for some districts, for most districts, once you miss 
a certain number of days, you are no longer eligible to get credit for that class. And so then you say to yourself as a child, well, why should I go back? I'm not going to get credit anyway. I might as well just drop out. So you see the slippery slope we get on. So time is of the essence. And even though the courts are in these, um, my, in my opinion, these reforms, the courts are stepping back and saying, we're not going to require you to come to court. We're not going to require you to um, provide us uh, specific reports on, an, on a time in a, on a specific uh, child. We are going to leave it to you, um, but um, we're going to have a certain amount of faith and trust based upon the process that we've gone through to develop this new system. We're going to have a certain amount of faith and trust that you are, in fact, being accountable and that, that, that if these... Um, these um, mechanisms that you're using in order to get the child engaged are not working, um, then try something different and try something different again. But, if, but at the most, you, know, you have to tell us when you need us because we can't afford to have the child miss any more school and get to the dropout stage. I've been thinking along two lines while working through my thinking about the school to prison pipeline. Um, <clears throat> one line is what I'll call the counterfactual line, um, which would be um, uh, show me the evidence mm. that there is a pipeline. Mm. Show me the evidence to support the use of the word cause. Um, why wouldn't kids be destined for incarceration anyway? and uh, whether they were suspended or not or given any kind of number uh, of series. No, no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no. We'll refer to some fictitious. Uh, All right. um, um, uh, my thinking along that lines is, is that the very phrase, school to prison pipeline, is, 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 contains two elements. One is causality, mm. school to prison. So therefore, it's already there. School causes prison. Pipeline. Uh, it's an imagery. The second one is, is the word pipeline, is that there is a, uh, cont a, a, a flow of effects that accumulate and so forth. So, in, in fact, the research is already set up. Uh, how we, what we observe, how we observe it, how we interpret it, and so forth. Um, but I, I really yet have not found def uh, research that I would really hold up in high regard that acknowledges the uh, contamination, let's say, of certain things we call fallacies, the ecological fallacy. You can have correlations between suspension rates and incarceration rates, um, but it's a spurious correlation. Or, um, uh, as, and you can't, but we make inferences about individual behavior and so forth. Um, the second line of thinking has to do with uh, that I might say nothing has really changed in the last 100 plus years. When I hear your, your emphasis on truancy, uh, which uh, I, my mind immediately thinks of the use of the term stubborn children at the turn of the century. So it's always been around. Um, there's, there have been um, various ways in which we, we describe the absence from school and so forth. So all that said, I'm kind of like ad ad adver advertising myself as a, as a cautious cynic here. Um, so let me get right to a, a, a question. Um, if, a, a, if a hypothetical situation, a child is, is gone from school for X number of days, I don't know, something like that, and they're, and they're brought in, I heard you say that there were a multiplicity of reasons for why they are truant. Um, my sociological contaminated mind immediately thinks, no, there aren't. There's no, never any multiplicity of anything. There's always about three or four. Um, so let's say that we, we focus just on that initial, which I completely agree, that initial micro situation where uh, before they enter, the enter the pipeline is some kind of notion, but we focus on the, the truant point. Um, I'm inclined to expect eminently reasonable, rationally thought out, uh, um, ethnically oriented uh, d uh, commands to not go to school. I think of research on called the school, uh, schooling penalty. That the child knows that 
the more they go to school, the longer they stay in school, the lower their income. And in fact, they're empirically correct. So um, my question is, um, uh, uh, what, what do they say? What do we learn? There are reasons for why they're not in school. And um, can we get any more definitive than multiplicity? And what would they be? Has there been any research on trying to reduce from multiplicity down to four recurring reasons why? And they're eminently reasonable. That's what I'd love to know. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've raised a lot of issues. Uh, let me see if I can sort that out. Um, Just are, is there, what's the evidence on why they're not in school? Well, research done just in the context of the Models for Change mm -hmm. initiative um, here in the state of Washington, done by Washington State University, primarily focusing on Benton Franklin counties, and then additional um, research that's been done by Dr. Tom George from the Administrative Office of the Courts here in the state of Washington, based upon the results of his um, assessment tool that he um, developed, uh, which is you now I'm it's the WARNS, um, the um, mm. risk and needs of, um, of, um, of student absenteeism, Washington absenteeism, um, really do focus on uh, particular issues relating to um, school failure, uh, which again is a kind of a, a maybe perhaps circular, um, but perhaps not, that the child does not feel successful in school and um, begins to retreat from that lack of success. And in particular, uh, it's, it really not, doesn't, um, doesn't look to all, all um, classes in school, all of the curriculum, but particularly the, the core areas of reading, writing, arithmetic sort of mm -hmm. thing, um, mm -hmm. where, and this ha begins to happen at a young age, which is why um, I was indicating earlier that some would argue that we are overly focused on middle school and high school, and we really ought to be looking at elementary school, um, where these patterns of, if you mm. will, disengagement, which is different from truancy, but it's, you know, it's a beginning of a pattern of sort of um, uh, phasing yourself out of the, of the school community and mm. the whole education environment. That certainly is one. And then there are, beyond that, um, elements that relate to um, um, family circumstances, um, which is a key component, and that is why the involvement of the family in the solution is so critical, and why if the school is not able to connect with the family or if the court is not able to have the family um, become involved, um, it's a, it's a virtual, virtual prescription for failure. Um, the the mm -hmm. family has to be supportive of the child attending school and to do whatever it needs to do to try to get whatever supports it needs mm -hmm. in order to permit the child to come to school. So that would be a second one. Um, a third um, major element has to do with um, mental health concerns. You know, there are, there are you know, depression, um, anxiety, those kinds of diagnosable mental health issues that are found to be in um, excessive, uh, be a, um, an indicator of, ex of a reason for excessive absenteeism. And then once you get beyond those three main areas, um, because, and I guess learning disabilities happens to be another one, but that is really more attached to the, the school failure and the, the feeling of a sense of, that's more of a, the school failure is, is, is sometimes related to a child who has a learning disability that's been undetected kind of thing. It can also relate to the health issue, I guess. But those are the key factors that, that the research that we've done here in the state of Washington indicate are, are what, what, what is, um, what is uh, occurring in our truant population. Now, um, I sat on truancy cases uh, right after the law took effect. Um, in 1995, it helped to develop the early systems that we used between 95, 6, and 7 um, for, um, for truancy cases um, in King County. And I did hear a multiplicity of issues uh, from these kids. Um, and um, some of them were as simple, or at least superficially simple. Now, I would see them once, and then they would, you know, if, if they went back to school, I never saw them again. Um, 
it was as simple as I'm too tired and I can't get up in the morning. Well, there's something else going on mm -hmm. there, but I take that as, you know, uh, at face value and say, what can we do to help? And so we talk in some very mundane terms, because I can remember it as though it was yes were yesterday, about, um, well, we'll get an alarm clock, and how about if we have someone call you, and then would you really do that? And then they get all kind of perked up. Um, and, and say, sure, I will. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But what I think, what I think has happened, you know, practicing psychology without a license, is that um, the child knows somebody cares and somebody's watching. Mm -hmm. And um, so therefore, you know, I'm really interested that you go to school and so I'm gonna go to school. Mm -hmm. But then we get um, some kids who would be crying um, because they're so afraid because they're being bullied. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at that point, it's not me as the judge who is certainly the person able to resolve this, but it is certainly get the school counselor on, involved, get the school, who, who, whatever part of the school administration um, needs to be aware of this in, in, and try to get them at the school level um, to create the kind of climate and the, the kind of safety and security that this child needs to feel um, so that he, he or she can safely go to school. And frankly, if they can't satisfy that at the school level, then they ought to be making arrangements to have the child within the district go to another school. Um, and we had all of the above happen in the context of a court hearing. The problem, or not the problem, but the, the point in, I... The in the context of a court hearing? Well, because these are, I'm doing, I'm hearing this now. These are my examples of okay. kids coming before me. What I'm saying is that that was a part of my learning of why should this be happening at the court level? And why can't right. these same conversations be had if the school, um, either for whatever reason, cannot do it by itself? Um, and I think there are a, a, a variety of reasons. I won't say multiplicity. There's a variety of reasons why the school isn't able to conduct those kinds of conversations on their own. For one thing, they don't have necessarily uh, folks who know about the resources that are available in the community if it is a community-wide problem. or um, what options might be available in another school if it's within a district, you know, all of these kinds of questions. So the, the team that needs to come together uh, can best be facilitated by either a school district personnel or like in King County, a team is facilitated by the prosecuting attorney's office who doesn't, doesn't, doesn't appear in truancy cases until and unless there's a contempt. Um, but in each community, or it could be the court. And the idea is that this conversation that I was having at the very expensive and adversarial setting of the courthouse doesn't need to happen in that expensive setting. They can have it at a community truancy board level, et cetera. Okay, can I, real quickly? Um, one of the we have just a few minutes left. Oh, okay, because okay. I want to go back to your, your I didn't say, I don't think that the, that the um, school to prison pipeline if it is stated as causal, uh, that it should be, because I don't think it is. No, it is not. I do, right. Absolutely I do right. think that, though, however, that, it, that there are legitimate correlations between kids who are truant, kids who are disengaged in school, kids who drop out of school, oh, and I, these other yeah, kinds of yeah, failures yeah, in life. Yeah. And, you know, the statistics that I never remember, but you know about the number of prison inmates who are, who've, who've dropped out of school and, um, and the like, um, not causality, and not that there aren't other risk factors, but school is, is, a, is a risk factor. Um, but it always has been in many ways. So uh, That doesn't mean that we've solved it. Oh, God, no. Well, no, right. absolutely <laughs> not, no, no. So we slapped a label uh, on it. One of, the, one of the more powerful studies I've ever read in my career, let's say, is, is when a, a, a black kid, small, uh, young black kids told her to take an IQ test, and they freak out. But they said, but, but um, you, you tell me, they said to the kid, you tell me when you want to take it. And in the meantime, you don't have to sit in a chair. You can do it on the floor and you mm -hmm. can eat Cheetos. When they set up those circumstances, right. the race differential disparity in IQ was erased. Right. My question, again, is do the kids who come to these before any court hearing, mm -hmm. do they know that they have been, in a way, labeled truant? Do they know what it has to do with truancy? And so what are the actual physical circumstances of the room? What I'm hearing is a lot of the official line. There's this and this and this, all the language and so forth. But the kids are looking up at this barrage of rules and people. I, I, I don't know. What, is it, what does it look like? Not I mean, necessarily. They're certainly not looking up at anybody until they get into court. 
and even then it depends upon how the court's you know sitting but um, the idea is for it to be a caring community that is working with this no, child I, to I listen un, to I the child. I understand that, but for, do, does the child see it as a caring situation? Well, we haven't done surveys yeah. um, on okay. how the child sees it, which would be a great idea um, uh, to do that. We do take um, surveys from kids about the workshop process. Um, you know, as a part of the qualitative evaluation of these workshops. Those are the, 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 the first cut, the broadest number of people. And um, they're very complimentary from the standpoint of the kids. You know, I felt that somebody was listening to me. I felt I was able to articulate my issues with the school, with the teacher, with the whatever, you know, fill in the blank was about. Um, the parents um, similarly um, had very positive um, things to say about you know, this was the first time I felt like I had an equal voice to the school teacher, or I'm sorry, to the school representative. They weren't um, things like they were they weren't lecturing me. This mm -hmm. was a conversation. You know, um, I'm paraphrasing good. obviously, yeah. but we are getting from, and that that includes workshops that are held in Clark County and King County. I mean, the very diverse place, Benton, Franklin, very diverse mm -hmm. places. We're getting um, generally positive experiences that way. Great. Well, this hour has gone very fast. It sure has. <laughs> <laughs> we have so much more to talk about. I'd like to thank our guests, Justice Bobby Bridge, and our co-interviewers, uh, Dan Lawner and John Richardson, for joining me today. You can read Justice Bridge's article uh, in the Journal of Educational Controversy. Come and join us as we continue our conversations uh, in the future. Thank you again.